This morning we're going to talk about a uh, declaration of dependence. Uh, if you want to turn somewhere, we're going to first go to Proverbs 14, then we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Also, lest I forget, I'm, we're blessed to have my aunt here this morning. Uh, of course, Dwayne and Marilyn's my aunt and uncle, that's mama's brother, and this is my dad's sister and my cousin Devin, and they live in Jasper, and they surprised us this morning. I was surprised, to say the least, so uh, uh, that's my Aunt Janie, and uh, her and her, her family's still at home, but her and her daughter came, and we're, we're glad that they're here also this morning. So uh, I said uh, Proverbs 14, 34, we'll just be there for a second, but mostly in Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you want to turn there. So tomorrow, the United States, of course, we're going to celebrate a, a crucial moment in the history of our nation. And it's the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, as we look back on that event, sometimes we forget it was a very dangerous decision for a man that dared sign it. It wasn't something they took lightly. In fact, John Adams signed it. He said, whether we live or die, whether we sink or swim, whether we succeed or fail, I stand behind this Declaration of Independence. And if God wills it, I'm ready to die in order that this country may experience freedom. And I want you to notice, is kind of what we're going to talk about today, how often that we see God as the, uh, the founder of our nation. Now, there were some men that found our nation, but God is all through our Declaration of Independence and all through our history. And that was the kind of patriotism that uh, led men to really armed with nothing more than hunting rifles. I mean, that's really all they had to engage in battle with what was at the time the, the, the most powerful nation in the world. So you had, uh, you had uh, England that was the most powerful nation in the world at the time, and you had the United States with just a bunch of guys with, with hunting rifles and things they used uh, around their places, their farms, their fields, and they went to war with that nation. Uh, the decision that they made to declare their independence from England, uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't something they did hastily. Uh, even though they lived in colonies, uh, they were English citizens. And we kind of forget that sometimes. So they're living in the United States. They live in colonies, but they're still English citizens. And they begin to feel like they ought to deserve the same rights that, uh, that freeborn Englishmen enjoyed. Uh, back in England. So they, they said, you know, why wouldn't we have those rights? And after all, it was their ancestors who a few centuries earlier had faced King John, and, and uh, King John, uh, because of what the English had done, they forced him to sign the Magna Carta, which is, uh, which is the great character, uh, the great charter that, uh, that was the rights of common man, uh, and, and limiting the power of the king over them. So England had already done that. So they, they had went to King, uh, king John, and they had forced him to sign that Magna Carta. And, and it simply said this, we're free men, and you have very little rule over us. And they had the king sign that. Uh, over a period of a few years, a different king came, and that was King George. And he began to ignore... Uh, the Americans, as far as the colonies were concerned, he just ignored them, and it wasn't long until he was oppressing them with taxes. He was uh, uh, he was putting all kind of regulations upon uh, these are Americans, they're English, they're living in America, uh, but King George is 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 taxing them. I mean, he's taxed them. He's putting all these regulations. He's really making their lives miserable, and then. Uh, they complained to King George, King George, King George, and uh, after they complained to him, uh, the 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 troops he sent over here, King George, and he declared martial law. Isn't that interesting? We've we've even heard that term in the last couple of years. You know, kicked around this martial law. Public protests were put down immediately. This is under King George. Uh, they used force, anything they could use. If there was anybody that had a, a rebellious voice because of the martial law he declared, uh, they were put down immediately. From that, the taxes increased. He, he oppressed the people even more. Regulations increased. Uh, he began really to, 
to tighten down the screws, and because of that, uh, some things started getting out of hand. Really, in Boston, one day a crowd was yelling at a tax collector that was there for, for the king, and uh, he fired into the crowd, and he killed an 11-year-old boy. Another time in Boston, a crowd of, uh, of soldiers were trying to, to gather up taxes, and they, uh, they gathered up all the tax uh, protesters that were there, and somebody gave a command to fire upon them, and, and through that there were, there were five protesters killed, and that, that became the Boston Massacre, and some of these terms you've heard when you were in school maybe, and just 14 months before the Declaration of Independence, uh, it was written, uh, before it was written, there was a conflict that, that broke out, with, that was called the Battle of Lexington, and and Concord, in between it, the, the colonial Minutemen and the British regular army troops uh, went to war, so to speak. Uh, casualties for both sides ended up about 366 were either killed or wounded, but uh, the colonists decided, hey, that's a victory for us. You know, we were able to stand up against this army, and uh, so the, the militias there that were with the colonies, they laid siege to Boston. They said, we're going to take Boston over. Two months later was the Battle of Bunker Hill, and uh, in that battle, the, the, the colonies lost about 400 men, so their siege of Boston was listed. Men to, meantime, it was during all that conflict when Patrick Henry uh, gave his fiery speech, you know, and, and uh, from Virginia. His, his famous speech was before the Virginia Convention, and, and this is what his, his speech said. Now, you know parts of this. You may know it all, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard, you've heard parts of this. This is the speech he stood up and, and he gave. He said, three million people armed in the holy cause of liberty. Notice there's again a reference to the holy cause of liberty. And in such a country as that we possess, we are invincible by any force which our enemies can send against us. So he says, we're a three million people, we're armed with a holy cause of liberty, and we're invincible to any force that can come against. He says, besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations, and who will rise up, friends, and he'll fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, and the brave. Besides, sir, is it now too late to retire from the contest? Is, there is no retreat but to submission and slavery. Our chains have been forged. They're clanking, and may they be heard on the plains of Boston. Gentlemen, we may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. Our brethren are already in the field. And why would we stand here idle? What is at risk, gentlemen? What would you say they have? Is life so dear, so peaceful, so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me... This is the part we all remember. Give me life, or give me liberty, or give me death. I mean, that was the speech that, uh, that he made there in Virginia, and as the war was beginning, that, uh, that gave courage and strength to men to let them know that, you know, God is, is the maker of nations. We're in a holy cause. We're, uh, we have God on our sides, and many of the forefathers that that uh, paid that, that price during that Revolutionary War. Uh, they finally won the ri a victory that, that citizens of the United States could be called the land of the free and the home of the brave. And folks, we don't need to forget that we are still the land of the free. We, we are still free today. We still have the uh, ability to vote. We still have the ability to make a difference. Now, you may feel like your vote doesn't do anything, but listen... We, got, we get a lot of folks that go out and vote about uh, uh, the President of the United States. Uh, and then all these little local elections, you know, I think our last election over here, uh, there was, Donna still here, there was 13 people voted or 15 people voted in all of this end of the county. That's where you make a difference. You know, the government starts small, and that's where we can make a difference. But 
Uh, I think we also forget that declaring of independence, our our forefathers also made a declaration of dependence. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning, and our time is shooting by. I've got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to move pretty quick through this. So that is what I said, the declaration of dependence, and talking about how our the beginning of our nation, our forefathers uh, declared their dependence on God. So the first thing they declared the dependence on God, uh, we weren't the first nation to do that. And I think it's important for us to understand this. We weren't the first nation that declared our dependence upon God because another crucial moment in history, the people of Israel was the preparing to minister, uh, enter the promised land. And we had talked about that over the last couple of months. Uh, And Moses said to them, now this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you, and be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. So what did Moses say? He said, we're going to move into the promised land that God has given us. He's created a nation for us. He's promised us a land. And when you go into that land and when you eat, when you're satisfied, Praise the Lord your God because he has given you this land. Don't forget the Lord your God. Listen to this, uh, also a part of the Declaration of Independence. It said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with a certain inalienable rights, that among these are liberty, life, or life and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sometimes we drop that word pursuit out uh, but, you know, it's your responsibility to go and, and work and, and take what God has provided and turn it into something. Uh, again, the closing words of the Declaration says this, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. That's God. So the, the Declaration of Independence starts with these words, that God has created us equal. Uh, it closes with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of of a divine providence, which is God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So it's important that we remember this clear declaration that was made by our forefathers wasn't just a declaration of independence, but it was also a declaration of dependence, to be dependent upon God. And and if we look back at at Israel as an example, uh, I've read some stuff on this and about a free nation and how long a nation can remain free. And basically, a, a nation can remain free until there's enough people to vote uh, to where the government supports them, and then you're no longer a free nation. So when you get a when your scales uh, get off balance, you have more people wanting to sit around than you do wanting to work, then you begin to lose freedoms. We're real close to that today. But uh, 3,400 years earlier... Uh, this warning could could really apply to the United States today, even though it was long ago. Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, in verse 7, Moses said, For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land, a land that streams of pools and waters, a land where bread will not be scarce, where you'll lack nothing. And then in verse 10 he says, When you have eaten and satisfied, praise your Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Continuing on, verse 11 through 14, Beware, lest when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fire in your houses and settle down, and all is multiplied, when your heart will become proud and you forget the Lord. He says, be on guard of those things. When God starts to bless you as a nation, be on guard that when you get fat and happy, that's what I say, when you get fat and happy and you sit back and say, hey, we don't need God. We got everything we need right here. God said, Nation of Israel, you better be aware and don't forget the Lord your God. So they declared their dependence upon God. So here's the second thing. Watch out that we don't forget about God, that we don't forget about God. And that's what Moses, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, is saying. The testimony of history has made it abundantly clear that not only nations but also individuals need to heed that warning, that we need not to forget God. The greatness of a nation is not measured on on its military might, it's not measured on its wealth, it's, it's measured in righteousness and justice. Those are the determining factors. Now, you may say this morning, well, that's real nice, your ideal. That's not my ideal. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34. Solomon, the wisest of all men, the wisest man there ever was, 
He said this, and we're talking about how nations have power. He says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Solomon said, hey, if you want to have a successful nation, we need to be righteous before God. What does righteous mean? It means a right relationship with God the Father. We need to have righteousness. We need to have justice. But sin will tear apart any people. Sin will destroy any people. And when it says people, it's talking about a country, a nation. So Solomon says, be, be aware. Think about what's happening today in the United States. To a great extent, our modern objectives have become success, status, and security. Uh, that's, that's all we're, we're worried about, just, just success, status, and security. They're followed closely by this, self-indulgence, comfort, and pleasure. Just whatever works for me, what feels good for me, let's just do that. Think about, and I, I just don't want you to leave this morning thinking, boy, how negative with this, but think about what our nation is doing now. And I'm saying a nation uh, really through our leadership, okay, not necessarily the, the, the majority of our nation is wanting to cancel culture. Why would, why would, why would our, our leaders want to cancel our history out? Well, let me tell you why, because what we're studying right now, they don't want... It being taught that, hey, this nation was founded upon God the Father, upon Jesus Christ. This nation, this nation has found its strength in righteousness and in justice. Uh, that, that's what, if we can forget all those things from the past and say, hey, we're moving forward, uh, then, then, hey, we've got, we, we've got half the battle won. Let's take God out of the picture. Let's say you, it's all right if you want to study God, but keep it over there in your own corner. Don't bother us with it. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to see it. And by the way, if you don't believe the way we believe, you're intolerant. And at some point, well, we wouldn't be surprised if you're not arrested. At some point, we're going to lose our tax status. I promise you, churches will lose that, that ability to say, hey, we're, we're a non-taxable entity. All of those things are going to be taken away, and that's to cancel out our culture. You know why? Because we have forgotten God. We've forgotten what God is and what he is, what he's about. If we went to the street, that well, look at Titus 3.3. 3. Paul says this, At one time you were foolish, disobedient, and deceived, and entangled by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We live in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about the, the, the nature of sin. Listen to it again. The nature of sin that people have, the nature of sin that, that are in people. At one time we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, entangled by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. You know, until we can turn around, we, we've got to realize that, that there's a problem and that we've got a problem. And, and folks, I'm not going to exclude churches from that. I think churches, sometimes I think we just... We like to just coast along, too, and say, hey, everything's going good at East Delta. Everything's going good in my end of the county. I'm just going to, I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm just going to coast right along. If you go to a wino on the street and you say, hey, buddy, I want to free you from alcoholism, he's going to say, I'm not a slave to alcohol. Give me that bottle back. I'm not a slave to anything. That, that's kind of way, the kind of way it looks. You remember the prodigal son? He went to his father. What did he tell his father? I want to be free. I want to be, I want to be free. I want to get out. I want to do the things. I want, to, I want to live however I want to live because I want freedom from you. And that prodigal son, he wandered around to the far country, the Bible says, and he, was, he must have been singing, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, I'm gone from home, I'm gone from daddy, I'm gone from the farm work, I'm gone from all of those things. Thank goodness I'm finally free, but it didn't last very long. You know, when he ran out of money, his friends left him, he found himself enslaved to a Gentile, feeding hogs, and he was in bondage. He was in bondage to that, to that taskmaster. He was in bondage of, of a slave to him. Where did he find freedom? He went back to the father. 
When he went back to the father, he said, you know, I'm not worthy to be called your son any longer. And the father said, wait a minute, you were lost, but you've returned. Go kill the fatted calf, get the, get the finest robes, put that signet ring upon his finger that, declaring I'm the, I'm the king's son, I'm the father's son, and I'm part of the family here. So for us, we don't need to forget God, and we need to really realize where our freedom is found. Here's the last thing. <clears throat> is our freedom really comes in Christ. So when we stand back and look at this land of free, we wonder, is there freedom anywhere? And I, I can say this morning, I thank, I thank God that as Christians, we are free. You know what the word redemption means? Christ says when we accept him, he has redeemed us. Redemption means he has set us free. When God redeemed us, when through Jesus Christ, he, he said, I have set you free. I bought you with a price, with the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, and I freed you from bondage. I freed you from slavery. I, I gave you free, and the Bible says what God has set free, they're free indeed. If we want to think about where can we find freedom today, we need to know that we find it in Christ. Paul writes a letter to Titus, and he tells them that, that we've been set free. Listen to what he says. He said, for this is Titus 2, 11 through 14. <clears throat> For the grace of God teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us, redemption, to set us free, to redeem us from wickedness and to purify us for himself a people that are his very own who are eager to do what is, what is good. You know, if you're really a patriot, I told y'all last night, uh, there was a guy sitting behind, he wasn't drunk when he got there, but he was drunk when he left. And uh, he thought he was a real patriot. He might have been, but uh, boy, they started playing patriotic music and shooting fireworks and he would just sing out three or four lines of a song, God bless the USA, real loud. And then he would say, God is our leader. He would just, and, uh, but when he was standing up saying all that, he was, he was going like this. And, you know, he was in, and uh, boy, as soon as the fireworks show's over, he was just back to his normal old self. I mean, he, 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 he may really be a patriot, but you know what? If you really want to be a patriot, if you're truly concerned about America, if you early want, er, earnestly want God to bless this nation, we need to live a life of harmony in the will of God. Amen? If you don't believe that, you've not listened because God tells us that, that when we live a life of harmony with him, he blesses the nation. We look at our president, we look at our Congress, we look at our government, we try to find safety and security, and then you're not going to find it there. You only find it in Jesus Christ. Only when one does what God directs us to do, that we say, God bless America, the land I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. So we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate tonight here at the church. We're going to celebrate tomorrow the, the birth of our nation. And, and I want to ask you to pray that our country may have a new birth. The Bible says we can have a new birth in Jesus Christ. We can be born again in Jesus Christ. Not a freedom that's built upon our government, but a freedom that's built upon Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? You know, we find that freedom as individuals. Patrick Henry, I love reading about those, those, those patriarchs of, of our revolution, just to, to look at their commitment to God, their commitment to country, their commitment to freedom. But it took each one of them independently to make that decision. You weren't just drawn in. You, you independently made that decision. That's true if we want to be set free in Christ. It doesn't have to do with your family, your church background, your history, your mom and daddy's service, your brother and sister service. It's individual. The Bible encourages us to look to the author and the perfecter or the finisher of our faith.
where we find freedom, that we might experience freedom that God can give us. You know why he gives us freedom over worry, over doubt, over fear, and from sins that so easily beset us, he gives us freedom. Our our founding father gave us freedom as a country. And but in Christ we find in him life and liberty and true happiness. Father, I pray this morning as we think about a declaration of dependence, we would know that we depend upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, I pray that we as individuals would make decisions. If we've never accepted you as a personal Savior, Lord, I pray that that your Holy Spirit would move in our heart and we'd realize that, you know, I've never accepted you. and, And in you I find freedom. I've been purchased. I was a slave to sin. I was bound by chains of sin. And in you I found freedom and life eternal. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd take the foolishness and rambling around of what I've had to say, but your spirit would place it in our hearts, give us a spirit of understanding, a spirit of wisdom. Lord, again, I thank you for our country. I thank you for the place that we live and the freedoms we share and the freedoms we enjoy. Uh, Again, I thank you for all the commitment that's been made through this Uh, through the beginning of this country and even up till today. Father, those that still stand for freedom, still stand for the declaration of independence and still claim the dependence we have upon Christ. Lord, I ask that you'd watch over and protect those that are traveling around on this long weekend. I pray, Father, also that you'd watch over folks tonight as they have celebrations and fireworks and uh, different activities. Lord, tomorrow I'm sure some things will be going on also. So, Father, I ask that you'd protect us Watch over us, keep us safe. Lord, I pray for our leaders, I pray for our nation. You tell us in Scripture, Lord, we know to pray for those that are in authority. And and you're the one that puts kings on thrones, Lord. So I pray that your will would be done and that we as Christians would be about serving you and we'd experience healing in this land. I pray this in the name of Jesus.